Believe it or not, I get a lot of questions on my wardrobe. Now, it might shock you to learn I'm not really a fashion-savvy type of uh, person, but I make up for a lot of what I have with hoodies. The hoodie is kind of a staple, I think, in this IT world, definitely amongst the MVP community, what I've come to notice. And uh, it kind of makes sense because it's an all-in-one. And it's a whole outfit, right? It's like a coat, but also a shirt. You got the hood. You could pop it up if you're feeling cold or, or you feel like isolating. So it's a, it's an entire, uh, it's an entire thing. I find that, um, I'm kind of set for any, any condition as long as you're in air conditioning. Cause if it gets too hot then the whole thing is, is ruined. Steve Weiner here from GetRubix.com, And today we're going to look at the top 10 things you need to do in an Intune environment in order to get windows autopilot stood up the right way. Whether you're building a tenant to test in, or this is ultimately going to be a production environment, we're going to walk you through these steps. Well, it's like blazers and suit jackets, right? Some people have a lot of those. I have a lot of these hoodies. So that's my preference. Get Rubik's solving for the modern workplace. So this is a question I get a lot, and I was actually just having a conversation with a friend about this. Basically, they were going to set up another Intune environment as a lab and wanted to know, like, hey, what are the what are the main things I need to do to get this up and running? Um, because there's a lot you can do. So I want to put this together as kind of a here are the things you have to do to make autopilot work uh, in your environment. Step one, this is a very easy one to miss, licensing. Make sure you have a user or users, right? If this is a real environment, they need to have the correct licensing installed, right? For the Windows Autopilot enrollment to work. Okay, so you wanna make sure users are licensed and what's the best way to do that? It's a good habit to get used to creating a group for licensing. In my case, I have a lab tenant with the Microsoft 365 E5 license. Whether you have business premium or E3 or an education SKU, it doesn't matter. I'm going to call this M365, uh, name it the group of the license, you know, the name of the license, licensed users. Let's go to the admin center, admin.microsoft.com, and we go to billing and licenses. And this is going to show you your licensing. So I have my E5 license here. All right. And when I click on the license, I want to click groups and then assign licenses. And now here I'm going to enter in that group I set up licensed user. So when I go to users, we can see Alan and Deborah are now in here. Next up, we have to make sure a Windows device can do two things, join an Entra and enroll in Intune, right? So there's two steps we have to take in order to make that happen. So this starts in the Entra portal, entra.microsoft.com. We go to devices and then device settings. Um, and we want to make sure of a few things. So we want to make sure users may join devices to Entra is set to all. Uh, require multi-factor authentication to join our register. This is highly uh, recommended. We're going to cover this in a future video more about security settings when we talk about conditional access. So for now, just make sure this is set to all, right? That's going to be really important. Now we have to make sure auto enrollment is enabled. We're going to go to devices, enrollment, and we're going to go right to the top and look at automatic enrollment. By default, this is turned off. So we select all and click save. The next thing we'll look at is CNAME validation. Well, what is that and why is it important? So right under automatic enrollment, you're going to see CNAME validation. When you have a custom domain in your tenant, you have to make sure the CNAME record is there. When you go through autopilot and the user enters, you know, uh, bob.smith at mycompany.com, you want to make sure it can reach Intune with the mycompany.com. And when you Google Intune CNAME, there's a great doc that walks you through it step by step. More than likely, this is going to be done by your domain admin because it's part of the larger Microsoft 365 setup. But what you just want to know is what are users going to be signing in with? In my case, it's uh, rubixdev.com. I hit test. And it comes back green, meaning my C, na C name is validated. So when I sign in with Steve at rubixdev.com, 
they're going to be able to enroll into Intune. Now let's talk about some device limits and platform restrictions, right? Uh, I told you to set the user scope to all for MDM enrollment, but how do we make sure only corporate owned devices are getting in? Back to the enrollment page, we're going to click on device platform restriction. And this basically has settings for Windows, Android, Mac, and iOS. And we're going to click all users to look at the default one. You can also create additional ones, um, but I'm just going to stick with the default. And we click properties. And here's everything we have. I'm going to click edit to open it up. So basically what this means is what kind of enrollment are you going to allow? For example, uh, if you were doing iPad or Mac OS, uh, you would be able to allow certain uh, versions of the operating system if you wanted to. Um, you can block personally owned, which is what we're ultimately going to do. You can block um, a certain platform in general. So if I were to block Mac OS, no, there isn't a single Mac OS device that can enroll in my environment. What we are going to do is look at the Windows MDM and we are going to block personally owned, right? So this is going to make sure only a corporate device can get in, meaning something we are enrolling with autopilot. And this ensures that, you know, even though we have the scope to all, you're not just letting anything in. Now on that same topic, you can also set a limit, a device restriction limit. So basically in Intune, users can have a maximum of 15 devices. Now you might not want them to have 15 devices. So maybe uh, in production, you set this to two or three. Uh, possibly even five, so you have some room for overlap if someone gets a PC refreshed. So I think that's a pretty good idea. For testing, you can leave it on whatever you like, but honestly, I think five is a good number, um, especially when we more talk about the production environments. We won't get very far testing autopilot if we don't create an autopilot profile. So we're going to create that enrollment profile so when a device is registered, it knows what kind of out-of-box experience to follow. From the enrollment page, you want to scroll down to the Windows Autopilot section, and we're going to click on Deployment Profiles. We're going to create a profile for Windows PC, not HoloLens, unless you want to do HoloLens. Pretty sure they discontinued that. And we're going to name it, and we can call this Default Autopilot Profile. So as far as the settings here, a lot of them I do like leaving alone. Deployment mode user driven, because that's what we're going to be testing. Just boot up a device, user signs in, autopilot kicks off the Intune enrollment. Um, hiding these three options is a great user experience. Kind of the point of autopilot is hiding the out-of-box stuff. So we're not giving users that many choices. Ooh, but I have to assign it to a group. I'm going to go to groups. And I'm going to create a new group. You definitely want to do dynamic device groups for this. Um, and I've done many videos on group tags and organization. And without going in depth here, we're going to pick a very simple tag um, so you can keep all your devices organized. So we're going to call this Rubik's Autopilot PCs. So we're going to add a dynamic query. I'll link to my blog where I discuss this. So you'll have the rules and everything you need to know about them. Now that I have that group, I can assign the autopilot profile to that. Now, autopilot enrollment's not going to do any good without settings or apps or things like that. Let's turn on a few basic device settings to apply to our PCs when they go through autopilot enrollment. All right, so from the Intune homepage, we go to Devices. We're going to click Windows and Configuration. Now, what I recommend starting with, because there's a lot of different types of policies, but we're going to create a new policy. We're going to select Windows 10 for our platform. And for profile type, we're going to go to templates and we're going to head down to device restrictions. This has a lot of great stuff in it we can use right off the bat to test applying policy to a device. And there are some very visible settings in here. We're going to go to App Store first. We're going to block developer unlock, turn off the game DVR feature. And we're going to block user control over app installations. If we go to cloud and storage, you can block adding non-Microsoft accounts to the system, right? So keep users from entering like a personal Gmail or Yahoo account, things like that. We can block manual unenrollment so users can't leave Intune. You can block things like removable storage. We can block internet sharing. And you can look through these and obviously make your own decisions, right? We're just picking some kind of, uh, you know, some basic stuff here. I'm going to hit next. And we're going to apply that restriction to our same uh, group, Rubik's Autopilot PCs. 
to really test the autopilot enrollment, we're going to need some apps, right? So it's a good idea to, you know, configure a few. Now, packaging apps is a whole other thing. And not that it's complicated, but there's a few ways we can do it. Luckily, there's a built-in way we can get some uh, desktop apps installed to our devices quickly within Intune. So we're going to click on apps on the left and then windows. And we're going to create. Now we're gonna choose store app new. And these are apps that both come from the Windows Store, but more importantly, WinGet. So these are gonna give us full, full applications. So let's pick a few. Um, so I'm gonna look for Firefox. There's Visual Studio Code. And I'm gonna pick one more, the Microsoft Company Portal, because that's gonna be a way for users to download their own apps in the future when you make them available. There's Company Portal. All right, so those are our three apps. We're all set. Next is update rings, right? We don't want the device to just, you know, go update itself without any kind of restrictions or policy on it. And it's very easy to create a Windows update ring to apply to your device. So from the Intune home menu, we're gonna go to devices, windows, and down to windows updates. Now we're gonna click update rings and we're gonna create a profile and we'll call this Rubik's default update ring. And this is another topic we've gone kind of in depth about having different rings, but just for the sake of getting yourself set up, I would say set up a basic uh, policy, leave a lot of these defaults on. I'm gonna set the quality deferral period to seven, leave feature to zero. Um, and I would say just leave everything else, that's fine. It's just important you have a policy so the device does get updates. So this should be very painless. Device compliance is going to be really important because you're going to want to know if a device is meeting the criteria you've set for it once it gets all these settings and uh, apps and, you know, update policy assigned. So let's make sure we have at least a baseline compliance policy assigned. So when it does enroll, it shows compliance. From the Windows device menu, you should see compliance under manage devices. We're going to create a policy and we're going to select Windows 10 11 compliance policy. And there's quite a few settings here. I'm going to show you basically the main ones. Device health. Uh, we want to, you can require BitLocker. Uh, secure boot's important as well. If you go to system security, require encryption on the data storage of the device. So for here, I'm just going to leave mine on require encryption. And let's go ahead and assign that to the same group. Rubik's Autopilot PCs. So now that we have all our configurations in place, the last thing you're going to need in order to really test autopilot is the enrollment status page. That's the part in the beginning of autopilot that shows you uh, the status. You're getting things ready for enrollment. You're installing, you know, how many applications and it'll track the status. So we need our, uh, we need to tell the enrollment status page what apps to wait for, whether it's everything or only certain applications. So to configure the ESP, we go to Devices, Enrollment, and then if you go to the Windows Autopilot section, you're going to see Enrollment Status Page. We'll click there, and I'm going to recommend using the default one that comes with the uh, tenant. All users and devices, and click Properties. And it's off by default, so let's click Edit next to Settings, and turn that on to Yes. Um, basically how long until we show an error, I'm going to leave it the default 60 minutes. You can enter a custom message here if you'd like, uh, what I'm going to recommend are a few settings here. So turn on log collection. Yes. Leave that on only show to new devices. That's what this provision out of the box means, uh, block device use until all apps and profiles are installed. Yes. Um, but if that's yes, you want to go down here and block device until uh, required apps are installed and we definitely want that. So now we can select the individual apps we have. So we have three. So here's the way I look at it. Visual Studio, not so important. That could come down later. I just want Firefox and the company portal. Maybe, uh, if you have, you know, think about anything you'd want there before the user is on the desktop review and save. And now my ESP is on. Obviously every organization is different. Your specific settings are going to change, but hopefully this will give you kind of a baseline to start thinking in, oh, let me run down a checklist and make sure I've done these activities so I could start testing autopilot. Uh, a lot of times I see folks who think they're using autopilot, but they don't have a lot of these uh, configured and they're not using a lot of these processes. So uh, 
this should definitely help you uh, getting started. And especially if you're just setting up a brand new lab and you want to get it up and running fast. Let me know your thoughts if, if this is helpful. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of things folks say, well, I, I do this in my tenant or you should do this. Again, just a baseline here. So let me know your thoughts and we'll be seeing you.